Sure. All right. Uh, the last talk, talk of the session will be uh, Decision and Complexity of Dolo Viao Hyperproperties, and Itsaka is going to give the talk. So thank you for the introduction. So yeah, so as I as said, uh, I'm Itzaka Rakotonirina, currently a postdoc student at uh, uh, MPISP uh, in Bochum. And this is our joint work on uh, the verification and complexity of some security uh, hyperproperties. But first, to give you a bit of context of on uh, what are these properties and what they are useful for, uh, let me show you a very simple example. So let's say you have a server and it's holding some kind of monetary price and to get it you have to uh, solve some kind of challenge. So you have uh, a public hash of some private value solution. And basically anyone can attempt to get this price by submitting a bit string to this server and uh, the first person uh, to get it right uh, would actually get the price. So it can be, I don't know, uh, you submit it at random and the first who is lucky enough gets a prize or maybe some people have uh, the solution before and they are the only person who are supposed to be able to get the prize. Does not, it's not really important, I'm putting a lot of details uh, under the rug here, but just to give you a very simple uh, situation for the sake of simplicity in this talk. So you have this property, you want that the server code essentially can maybe enforce a lot of different properties, but what you want here is that it essentially gives out the price to uh, the first uh, received correct solution. But there's also uh, another interesting property that I call fair reward here, so some kind of fairness property, uh, which is that uh, if you don't know the solution, you shouldn't be able to get the price. So now this may seem a little bit confusing because uh, it seems to be a complete uh, corollary of uh, the correctness property, like if the server is only giving uh, prizes to people that have the solution, then if you don't have the solution, you shouldn't be able to get the price. But actually the properties are completely different. And the kind of cases that uh, fair reward exclude, excludes is actually this one. Like someone has the solution, it attempts to submit it to the server, but what, what happens is that the submission is through um, um, an asynchronous uh, compromised network such as the internet. So maybe another agent has control over some uh, devices that are used to perform the communication. The message is intercepted, copied, and then the second agent will submit it in their name uh, for a server before the first uh, submission goes through. And if this scenario is, able, is enabled by uh, the particular implementation you're considering, uh, correctness will not be violated, but fairness will be. So if you take a step back, uh, you have two very different kind of properties. You have the first one, uh, so what I call functional properties here, which are really about studying the possible behavior of a, a concurrent system, which is a very common target in program verification. And then the other one is the one we are studying here, uh, are rather security properties, or what I call Dolevio uh, properties in the name of a seminal paper introducing these kind of models which is really about studying the behavior of, the, uh, of a system in an adversarial environment. So some part of the system are compromised and it essentially means that you have to replace them by some placeholder and um, this can be essentially any program, you don't know how it will behave, but you have to enforce your property despite uh, this uncertainty. So in the first case, you just want to say like, uh, as I said, it's typical uh, program verification stuff. You want that for all execution of your system, it complies to some specification in a logical formalism typically. And in the second case, um, it's somewhat similar. You want to quantify over all possible executions of your system. The executions are adversarial because there is always, uh, as I said, like here the network, but there are parts that are compromised and you don't know how they will behave. But the question is, what do you, what is this uh, execution supposed to verify? Because it's not about the um, specification of the server, it's something that happens completely outside of it. So let me give you um, an idea of how to do that. So what we actually want is that for all possible executions of the system, there exists actually another execution T prime that verifies two properties. First, this, ex this second execution should be ideal in the sense that uh, it should be obvious that it's impossible to mount an attack in this uh, execution. So typically we require that uh, whenever someone emits a request, it is immediately accepted or, or refused, but immediately, immediately treated by the server and answered. So meaning that it's uh, infeasible to mount a theft attack in these kind of uh, traces. And the second property is that the two traces should have the same final state. Uh, 
So it's some kind of uh, simulation statement where you say, for all executions of your system, it's an adversarial execution, so some very nasty things could happen, but at least the final state of your uh, execution should be the same as a trace where uh, nothing bad could happen. Could happen. And typically, uh, if you have the above attack that is possible, this kind of security uh, would be uh, violated. So if you look at the global picture, you have some kind of hierarchy of properties. You have first uh, the difference between trace properties and hyper properties, which is about the number of quantification over executions of your protocol that you have in your property. And the second distinction is between these green boxes and these orange boxes. So the green boxes are uh, the normal uh, program verification stuff about uh, the, yeah, the behavior of uh, a concurrent program. And the orange boxes are about the study of, the pr of these programs in environments that cannot be controlled. So you have to take to account for this, and it's usually much more complex, and it adds uh, another layer of, of undecidability when you want to tackle the verification. Still, you have a lot of uh, tools and uh, results uh, for some of these boxes, actually the above three. But the last one uh, has been mainly left uh, out, and you basically have, no, as far as I know, no work on uh, these Dolevio hyper properties in the literature, and we wanted to propose some theoretical foundations for it by proposing some decidability and complexity results uh, for this class of properties. So, about the more technical details about what we do, uh, here are some information about the model that we use to, to formalize these hyper properties. So, first, uh, since we're tackling mostly security applications, we need some kind of model of cryptography uh, in our model of processes. So, typically, we use a, a standard model that is called a symbolic model of cryptography. So, the uh, cryptographic functions are just represented as uninterpreted symbols. Uh, like here, for example, you have decryption, encryption, or verification of digital signatures. And the uh, cryptographic properties of uh, these uh, operators would be modeled by rewriting rules. So here, for example, the, the top rule uh, models that if you decrypt an encryption with the correct key, you get uh, the plain text as a result. So it's something very standard and not so complicated. And once you have that, uh, the terms of this term algebra, so the sequence of, uh, sequence of applications of these symbols, defines what uh, a message is, uh, a message used by uh, your distributed protocol. Then the protocol in questions are just defined by um, some, again, a standard uh, co um, calculus of concurrent processes called the applied by calculus. What is important to notice here is that uh, since we're working in an adversarial statement, uh, um, adversarial context, uh, you have these outputs and inputs that are supposed to be on a compromised network. So whenever you send a message using an output, it is leaked to uh, compromised parties. And when you expect an input from the network, a, a priori it's a forgery from one of these dishonest parties using the output that they saw uh, previously during the execution. So this is a very standard core for modeling, for, for, for modeling um, protocols in an adversarial environment. In addition to that, we added a lot of features like a real time and a global state, typically, so that our decidability results wouldn't be uh, linked to uh, a too limited uh, model. So we try to encompass as many uh, features as we could uh, by looking at uh, different models from the literature. And uh, finally, last but not least, uh, how do we uh, model hyper properties? So we use actually a logic. Uh, from the literature called hyper tidy CTL star. So if some of you are familiar with hyper properties, you, I guess you know uh, about the hyper CTL star, and this one is essentially an extension of this logic uh, to our context when you can have terms, cryptographic primitives, and uh, basically an adversarial environment. So here I show you the shape, for example, of uh, the theory world property. So you have your two uh, quantifications over uh, the executions of, of uh, your system. And uh, what I, well, I won't go over the details of uh, the definition, but just to show you that this is basically a standard uh, logic for hyper properties. You have uh, temporal operators like globally until uh, some atomic formulas. But what is Im very important here is uh, this quantification for all x, which is basically a quantification <laughs> over terms. So how I represent messages uh, in uh, this model. 
And this is typically, well, something that adds a layer of indecidability and something that is not captured by, uh, it is not available in existing logics for hyper properties, and which is also why we cannot really rely on the very big literature of decidability on uh, regular hyper properties, I mean, not in an adversarial context. So, all that being said, Basically, our main result is that you can decide whether a process satisfies a hyper property, a Dolevio hyper property, <laughs> under some conditions. Uh, because yeah, otherwise, we also prove that the problem is completely undecidable. Uh, but we believe that the restrictions are somewhat reasonable. So, first, uh, you want that you only have a bounded number of participants uh, in your uh, distributed protocol. So, usually we say bounded number of parallel sessions. Uh, it doesn't mean that your program is bounded completely because there are always these adversarial parts, these compromised parts that are essentially arbitrary programs, but at least the execution depth of your program is bounded. Second thing, we have some, again, very standard restriction on cryptographic primitives, so it's a technical class of cryptographic primitives that essentially captures a very common primitives like, I don't know, encryption, uh, signatures, zero-knowledge proofs. But uh, it excludes um, typically be, um, primitives that have associative commutative behaviors like XOR or group ex exponentiation. And uh, finally, uh, this, these quantifier over terms that I mentioned a couple of slides ago, uh, uh, they have also to be slightly restricted. So you can put as many quantifiers as you want as, soon as, you're, as long as you're talking about quantification over executions. But if you want to put quantifier over terms, or so over trees in some sense, you have always to use quantifiers that make reference to terms that are used during these executions. So you cannot use the logic to express arbitrary first order formulas over trees that have nothing to do with your distributed protocols, essentially. So this is a very natural restriction, and it is verified in most cases in practice. And the only exception is what I try to, to draw here is some kind of indistinguishability properties that are sometimes considered in security. So it's some very involved form of uh, non-interference. So non-interference can be expressed uh, uh, under our restrictions, but sometimes you have some more complex notions that here cannot be uh, expressed uh, with our restrictions. So now I had the choice between uh, giving you some technical details about the decision procedure, but uh, I think that would not be very helpful because it's very technical. Uh, but what I think would be more interesting is to give you a bit more insight about the complexity results. So we had the decision procedure to obtain our main theorem. Uh, we also studied some complexity lower bounds and studied the complexity of our problem. And essentially, we managed to obtain some tight security bounds in many different contexts. So typically, we studied the problem for uh, bounded or unbounded processes for different classes of cryptographic primitives and for different classes of uh, formulas, so it could be hyper or trace properties. And we studied the exact complexity to somewhat pinpoint what were the parameters that made the complexity blow up. So the red box on the bottom right is actually the complexity of the full fragment that we study. So it's complete with respect to the um, exponential hierarchy of complexity. So it's slightly below uh, X space, so it's uh, very huge. And uh, essentially, you see that, uh, for example, the jump from uh, the, uh, the last line and the, uh, the non-line, so the one when you don't have cryptographic primitives, show you, for example, uh, uh, the impact of uh, supporting cryptographic primitives in your model. And also, you also typically see that uh, if you're jumping from uh, bounded to unbounded processes, you, you become uh, quickly undecidable, even if you only support, like, for example, hash functions, so an uninterpreted uh, um, function, basically, without any rewriting. So, um, this may be a bit discouraging because, well, I mean, XP poly is not something that will uh, likely result in uh, something very efficient. But we're somewhat uh, confident that you, we, we have not done it, so it would be, I guess, a, a project on its own. But uh, we could actually do an implementation of this procedure. And here the blow up is really due to uh, the number of alternation between quantifiers. And as you saw in the example, in many cases, you're actually interested in simulation-based property where it's basically a for all that exists. So it's likely that the practical complexity of this algorithm would be much lower. So as a conclusion, so as I said, uh, the goal was really to provide some theoretical foundation to make a first step uh, 
on uh, the study of uh, these Dolebio hyperproperties that have been a bit left aside in the literature. And uh, in the future, we were planning to tackle a little bit the technical challenges of this implementation, of a possible implementation, like study uh, what kind of optimization could be if we could maybe study a smaller fragment that would be more practical to study. And uh, we also conjecture that this limitation that we have currently that excludes uh, indistinguishability properties could actually uh, be lifted. Uh, I mean, it would be a lot of work. Uh, we're still investigating it. But well, at, let's say that's a conjecture we have, and we'll see in the future if that actually holds. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, on your last slide with the complexity overview, mm. what are non-relational hyperproperties? Um, so, uh, yeah, I just want to put uh, two technical names, but it would be the equivalent of CTL star if you're familiar with it. So essentially, uh, you have trace properties that are saying for all, for all traces something should hold. You have fully relational hyperproperties when you have arbitrary quantifiers and then the formula that you want to express expresses relations between your several traces. But for example, if you say some property of the form uh, for all traces, like aliveness property, for example, for all traces, if some trigger happens, then something, there should exist a continuation of the traces so that something happens, then this would be a non relational hyperproperty. Well, maybe you shouldn't call it a hyperproperty, but a non relational property, I don't know. But you have several quantifiers, but it's just that they are nested and they are not put in relation one with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, branching time, exactly. Are there any other questions? Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, as far as I understood it, uh, the logic you presented was an extension of hyper CTL star, right? Yes. Um, how do you c bring together your complexity results with the complexity results for hyper CTL star that um, indicate that the model checking pr problem, for example, is hard for the exponential tower while your complexity is lower and you have an extension? Yeah, so uh, this is a good question. Uh, I get it quite often, actually. Uh, it's an extension, but an extension in name. I mean, formally, I mean, the syntax is very highly uh, inspired from CTL star, a hyper CTL star, um, the, the semantics as well. But here we're working in a very different context. Like in hyper, in, uh, in hyper CTL star, typically, the system that you're verifying is typically an automaton, and you're studying infinite runs in this automaton. Here, uh, the system that we're studying is a concurrent process, and the executions of your concurrent process is a finite step of, execu of uh, execution steps, basically. So the, even the execution models are very different. The logic in itself follows the same, uh, the same principles, I would say, but the execution models are completely incomparable in the end because we're tackling very different notions. So here, uh, it's like, adversarial executions in a concurrent uh, algebra and in the other it's like some finite state automaton and because of that the result seems to be a bit contradictory but in in practice uh, the two things are actually very different uh, thank you are there any more questions so it looks like considering the adversarial behaviors makes the problem more difficult, but yes. are there some restrictions or some cases where it actually makes the problem easier? For example, in other contexts, sometimes when you go from some system to a lossy system, things become easier, like more decidable or less complex. Um, maybe the case. Uh, the problem here is uh, that Okay, maybe th some cases where it could be uh, easier if is uh, when the adversary actually completely breaks the system, like uh, if the system is only secure uh, if the adversary is not here. So in this case, it somewhat becomes easier because the adversary completely breaks anything, so you have nothing to verify. Uh, but in general, it's not the case because the big problem is the rewriting system that you have to use to model your cryptography. So you have several layers of Turing complete, uh, of, uh, Turing complete mechanisms that are interacting with each other. So the, uh, the adversary somewhat makes everything blow up whatever you would try to do, even in simple cases, actually. Thank you. Our
Thank you for the good talk. I wonder if you have mapped these two program logic or some kind of process algebra that can express those uh, um, Dolevyao hyperproperties as well, instead of just staying at the kind of like abstract layer level. So, sorry, I didn't get the question. So you... I'm sorry. I, I wonder if you know of any program logic or, or process algebra that would actually also embed some of the reasonings you've done here. Oh, oh okay, I see. Um, so the, there exists. So the 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 term algebra, the the process algebra that we're using, it's uh, well established in expressing uh, adversarial uh, behaviors. Uh, mostly in the literature, they were only focusing on trace properties. There has been some extensions to consider like these indistinguishability properties uh, that uh, we're not uh, supporting here in this result. Uh, but in most cases, uh, the, this hyper tidicity star logic that we're using, this is the only one we're aware of that supports these kind of uh, hyper properties in a general sense. All right, let's thank Itzaka one more time.